Motivating. Chief Digital Officer of G Hitachi, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you for having me. Yes, I'm excited to hear about the work that you've done. You come from a different perspective than a lot of the nuclear engineers that I meet usually. So I want to dive into all that with you. But first, let's just start with your background. You're from Egypt, correct? I am. When did you come here? So I was born and raised in Egypt. Uh, I went to the Persian Gulf and lived in the Persian Gulf with my husband for six years in Abu Dhabi. And then we came here in 1990. What were you doing in the Persian Gulf? I was working as a technical consultant. Yes. Uh, and then we came to the States in 1990. So we've been here for 29 years. So uh, the accent doesn't go away. <laughs> I've been here for a long time, but it still stays. So. My Long Island accent doesn't go away <laughs> either. Right. So just, some right. things are hard to shed. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, okay. So what brought you here then? So it, it is a long story. Uh, my, so. it, it was a personal uh, situation where my father was having the surgery. We came here to be with him. But then the Gulf War started mm. and we decided to stay here because it was safer than going back to the Persian Gulf. This is where we were wow. in 1990. And then so. how do you think about that? How do you think of just, I'm just going <laughs> to apply my skills in a whole new place <laughs> and course. just make it work? <laughs> Actually, you know what? It's I, I think that you get faced with certain situations and you've got to uh, just you pull on your resilience. I mean, it was it was a tough decision. It was a tough decision to stay in a country that, you know, just on a whim. We, we When we came here, it was just for a visit. We did not have the intention to stay, right? And then, of course, my 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 brothers were here. They were settled here. They've been in the States for a while. Uh, my mother-in-law was here, but but we did not have the intention to come at least for a while and stay. It was just a visit. But, you know, things happened and we decided that, you know, it was the safest thing to do and we stayed. And is that when you decided to get your master's in electrical engineering? That's right. And that was at Purdue, right? That, that was, yes, yes. So I have, an, uh, I have an engineering degree from Egypt, from Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, electrical engineering. And then this is when I decided to get my master's in electrical engineering. And you turned that into kind of a software career, right? That is right. Yes. So I was, I was electrical engineering until I got my master's. And then my master's, I had some focus on computer science. And this is where it piqued my interest. And I think at the time also, computer science was becoming very popular and hot and you could see all the different things that you could do with technology. So I decided to take that pivot and get into the computer science and, and software engineering. So what did you do with it? Where did, where did you take it? What kind of projects did you work on? So um, I started actually my career from the bottom. So I started as a developer yeah. and I worked at the Polaroid company, they had actually a division for IDs. Polaroid. So, we, so yes. Polaroid, I guess this was when Polaroid was still around. That's right. So Polaroid, I don't know if they're still around or not, but they had an ID systems division. Mm. And all we worked on were the systems like the ID cards, the driver licenses, the software that created them. Mm. So if you have, and I, I, I don't know where you reside, but <laughs> your your state driver license, we had most of the state software for drive, for the creation of the driver license. I see. So when we go to the DMV and they that's do the right. help print up thing, that's, that's right. that was you guys. So, yes, that was us. So it was, yeah, you take your picture, you make sure that you have the watermark so it is secure, etc. So that was my beginning in software engineering was with Polaroid ID systems. Uh, I then moved moved to uh, Fitch, which is a company that does, you know, Fitch ratings. They mm. had a, a, an arm that did risk operations management. Mm. So I moved into software, into that company, and then I came to GE. Uh, so and when you came to GE, GE, that was GE Capital, I guess. That's right. So, so what moved, is GE Capital? What is GE Capital? It's the financial arm of GE. It used to be much bigger than it is now. So at a certain point in time, GE Capital probably was 30% of the whole GE company. And we had multiple businesses. Some of them were lending. Some mm -hmm. others were leasing. And what, what we did from a software perspective is just helping our customers getting those loans or getting those leases and uh, doing it in a secure way, doing it in a seamless way. So I remember like one of the very last uh, positions, roles that I had 
was uh, being responsible of a whole center of excellence for the leasing platform. Mm. And what we did, we had a platform called Touchless. So Touchless meant that from the minute the customer would walk into uh, an agency to, to lease equipment, to the minute they get their equipment and all the steps in between would happen with no touch from the customer hmm. or from anybody in the business. So wow. we did, yeah, we did the credit checks, we did the know your customer, we know. So all that was through software and analytics. So that's that that was a good run. Yeah, so that's uh, that's fixing one of those pain points that when you go to a bank and it's just like uh, there's a For paper sure. and exactly. there's the person and you got to deal with exactly. the time, there's a being there, that's it's like right. the whole thing. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that was kind of a, um, and it was still, so even though it was the financial arm of GE, it was still a, it was a product in a certain sense. That's right. That's right. It yeah. was a pro, so it was a software product. It had a lot, it had a lot of analytics and uh, dependence on a lot of data and historical data. So this is where all my background in GE came from, right? So I was building that and then came to Nucleo. Well, okay. Well, you're not just coming <laughs> to nuclear. How did you end up in nuclear? So after 10, 11 years at uh, GE Capital, I saw that uh, position that was in nuclear and it seemed like a great position. And I, I was really interested in the nuclear business specifically. Mm. So I really wanted to go from capital to industry and then industry specifically something like nuclear that always was really near and dear to my heart. Why? I've I've always believed I'm an environmentalist. Uh, and I believe I do believe in nuclear power and the power of nuclear power. Amazing. And yes, and I, I do believe that we do need to push for carbon free and we need to change the narrative. And we need and it was exciting to me that I would come and help a business go and do that. So, so this wasn't just a new intellectual curiosity. This was value alignment for you as well. Absolutely. It was both. So that was, it made it the perfect opportunity because it was great from a career perspective. And also I believed in the nuclear industry and it was a wonderful opportunity to come and work and, and, and use my, my talent and my knowledge here. Okay. So what were some of the first projects that you took on? <laughs> so I'll tell you what I, what I do is... Let me take a step back and tell you what I think the the challenge for the nuclear industry is and the thoughts about how can we work on it and help from a digital perspective, from a software, data, analytics perspective. So you hear it, everybody talks about it. The biggest challenge that we have is the cost. Yes. We're very high cost. So if you look, and I'm going to give you some uh high level numbers. So Don told me on it, it's not like really okay. exactly which year and how was it calculated. But on average, like the nuclear industry, the cost is $33 per megawatt hour, okay. right? Gas, everybody knows, is 25. Yeah. Now, when you think of that, so that is a big disparity. That is something that needs to be done about that. We're not going to be able to survive as an industry if we continue with that cost profile. If you look at that cost profile of $33 per megawatt hour, it's broken into three pieces. So you've got the capital investments, you've got the fuel cost, and then you have the operation and maintenance cost. Mm. So capital and fuel can change much. Yeah, maybe you can change just a little bit, you can push it a little bit, but most of the, the, the opportunity there is in the operation and maintenance. Mm. So you've got six, if you think of the 33, there are six, around six in operation, in, in, um, in capital cost, six in fuel. So you've got around $21 per megawatt hour that are in operations and maintenance. Wow. So how can you look at those and what are the levers that you can pull so that you can reduce that maintenance and operation costs. It's crazy because, I mean, did you say six was in the fuel? That's incredible because as cheap as natural gas is, quote unquote, you know, right. for now it right. is, um, <laughs> the majority of their cost is fuel. Is the fuel. So, I mean, out of their $25, it's, 
got to be, uh, I don't know, probably 18 of it is fuel costs. So uh, fuel to fuel comparison, nuclear would wipe the floor of natural gas. And they're, it's not like they're not running big, heavy industrial complexes either. They also have machineries and things that spin around and dangerous Absolutely. things too. And somehow they're able to get their cost profile so low. So that's, that's the opportunity price. for us. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So how do we do it? So how can you, yes, yeah, that's <laughs> the question. So how, how do we do that? So where are the opportunities? How can we tackle these? So the first thing is to understand that I, I believe that everybody understands now that we need, because it took us a while as an industry to just look ourselves in the mirror and say, yes, we've got a problem. Yes, we're not going to survive. Can I, can I ask you why? So wait, when did you join the nuclear side of the uh, Four years ago. Okay, so you came in with pretty fresh eyes. That's right. Um, and you saw an industry in pain. That's right. I mean, so how do you interpret why it took the industry so long to look itself in the mirror and say, we've got to address cost? You know what? I think that there was a certain time where the industry was on, in a high because things were going very well. We were building plants. You know, it was almost like a renaissance. And then, you know, a couple of events happened and everything went down. And first it was the shock of what's going on. And then you realize that, you know, you're not building any more plants. Some of them are retiring because of cost. So I think this is where everything played together. And then the industry started realizing a few years ago that, you know, it's just not sustainable. So, yeah. Right? So there were some nuclear PTSD for a little bit, and then <laughs> we went right. through therapy, and now we're coming out of therapy, and we're working on problems. I didn't want to put it this way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, back, back, back to the solutions. <laughs> that's now. right. That's right. So, uh, so it, it everybody now realizes that we do need to work on our past, and that was the nuclear promise, delivering the nuclear promise that came out two, three years ago. And that was a big push on getting everybody to look at their costs and see what, what can, can we do about it, right? And there were all these efficiency bulletins, et cetera. So there are a few things that we need to think about. So one of them, from my background, is that I believe that data is the solution to many, many, many problems, yeah. right? So we do have droves of data in the nuclear industry. And if you think of the other industries and the other environments and how they use the data and you compare us to them, you see that we're doing almost nothing. We're not leveraging the amounts of data that we have. Okay, so what are they doing? How have they been able to reduce their headcount from, I mean, a nuclear plant has 800 people per reactor and a natural gas plant has like... 20 people per reactor or something. How are they using data to reduce that? Count? Actually, I was not going to talk about even gas. I was going to talk about just a very generic look at all the other ways. So think. I think the first thing that comes to mind is the consumer industry, mm. right? Think of the consumer industry and how they started using the data to their advantage. Mm. Think of Amazon and Google and all these I mean, these were companies that were startups 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and now they are worth billions and yeah. billions. And, and what do they have? Most of what they have is the data. Yeah. This is how they grew by leveraging this data. But, okay, but we're not going to have nuclear plants sell advertisements on keyword searches. So they what not. can the nuclear plant do with this data? I will tell you, I will tell you the analogy that comes to my mind and how we went, we need to translate it. So think of Amazon. We're not going to sell anything to in the nuclear industry like Amazon. But think of Amazon and how they build a profile for you, mm. right? So they have, it's not only a demographic segmentation, right? So this was like the first step where they would do the market segmentation, et cetera. We're way beyond that, okay. right? So now they have a whole profile of you. Yeah. It's not only the demographics. It's who are your friends, your connections, what are the purchases that you made, what are the things that you looked at but you did not purchase, uh-huh. what are the ads that you clicked on. What Every single thing that you do on the net is captured and it builds the profile just for you, Brad, okay. yeah. right? 
And they use that profile to recommend things, send them in specific, when there are specific occasions or events, et cetera. So it's very targeted to you as a person. And that's how it becomes so powerful. Yes. Now think of our industry or any other industry, manufacturing industry. When you think of our assets, the equipment, right? So we have been treating the equipment. We've got equipment in the plant, right? We put it there, equipment runs. How do we do the maintenance in the nuclear plants? It's time-based. Yes. So you have installed that equipment, that asset now. You've got this one has, uh, what, let's say, every three months. Every three months, you go and you do the maintenance on it, right? Sometimes it's offline, sometimes it's online, etc. Does that equipment need every three months maintenance, right? So that's the very first question mm. that we have to ask. So moving, this is a huge saving, moving from the timed maintenance that we have been doing for years to condition maintenance. Mm. Why wouldn't we go to condition-based maintenance, right? It becomes so much, it makes so much more sense and becomes so much more accurate when you build the profile of each of the assets that you have, right? Yeah. So if you got a pump, it is different than if you have a condenser, it is different than if you have the whole resource system. And each of these, you have, you build that profile. So you've got the design, you have the design already, it has been designed, so you have the physical model. And then you get all this different data that pertains to that equipment. So you have the rounds, the manual rounds that they do, they go, they look at the equipment, you've got the information about that. Mm. You've got the work orders that were put together in a system that can give you all the information about what is the maintenance that was already done for that equipment. And then you have the instrumentation. So we put sensors on the equipment, we pick up the data from that instrumentation to see how that asset, the equipment is performing. And all these data gets together into a profile that tells you how to maintain properly that equipment without going overboard and doing it on a timely basis that is not needed. And at the same time, not getting, you know, like unexpected uh, outages that you, that you, you don't want. I love it. Um, I can totally see this working. How do we test this? Do you take this um, theory to operating plants and say, um, hey, you know, if, you know, can you give us your, um, <laughs> I'd say like salary data, but yes. can you give us your, you know, how much you spend on operating and maintaining your 10,000 different components and then let us, you know, hypothesize a new maintenance schedule and then based on that new maintenance schedule, show you how you're able to you know, reduce staff by 10 or 20 or 30 percent. Is there a way to, to test that out in, in yeah. practice with a power plant? Yeah, yeah. So we have, we actually have a software and we're working with Axelon already, right? So they have put it in their plans. They already have deployed it, right? And they're working on it. So they, we do not get the data. It goes into the cloud. So we have one of the, the probably the, the most challenging pieces of all the story I told you and anything that we're going to talk about related to data and software is bringing the data together on one platform. Mm. That is a universal problem that everybody has. People have data in different systems, right? So they created the system for the assets and this is where they keep the work orders. They have another system that keeps the instrumentation data. They have a third system mm. that has the performance indicators, right? These systems do not talk together. So one of the most challenging and the very first step of doing that is to bring all the data together into the cloud. Oh, well, this sounds like a product that you could start selling to plants. Absolutely. So even, even if you weren't reducing labor, giving them, I, I mean, I'm sure, even if, sorry, even if you weren't reducing operations and maintenance labor, I'm sure that there's a certain amount of data collection labor uh, that you could immediately reduce just by getting it in a neat, organized, searchable for format. sure, for sure. So this is, yeah, but that would be just scratching the surface. Yeah. I think the biggest value of it is and just... And doing predictive maintenance. Absolutely. Doing yeah. the predictive maintenance. It's a big, it's a big thing for Now, what about the NRC? Because um, 
it is notoriously difficult to get any changes made, even when they want to. Like, I, you know, I've been at these NRC meetings and they're like, oh, we want to incorporate digital technologies. Okay. We want to incorporate risk-informed um, decision-making. That's right. But it takes so many years for them to figure out how to actually implement it. That's right. So what do you, what do, you do about that piece of the So it's a couple of things, I believe. Uh, one of them is we stay away from safety equipment. Mm -hmm. So that, that makes it a little easier because anything that is safety equipment becomes a long wall, right? Yeah. With all the regulation and everything else. And then the second thing is that anything that we do in the products is just a recommendation. Mm. Right. So you give a recommendation and then at the end of the day, it is the utility that is going to decide whether it does make sense for them. Mm. Right. They're going to test it. They're going to see whether it works for them or not. And, you know, they they make the decisions of cost versus the reliability versus risk. It is nothing that is going to be decided and implemented automatically by the software. Got it. So. And are you looking to uh, new reactor developers who maybe haven't even set up fully integrated the, the sensors in their systems yet to um, to give them this tool, to give them this approach uh, to think ahead in terms of how they're going to manage their data before they design the system. For sure. So this is, I think that this is where the biggest opportunity is for the nuclear industry. And when we talk, I talk a lot of, with John Ball and, and with the new uh, plants team, when we think of those small modular reactors and all the new reactors, I mean, the, the assumption is that we're going to have a very small staff, right? How are you going to do that? I mean, it's not going to be only by designing the plan. It's how you're going to run it. Yeah. And you have to run it in a very efficient, intelligent way. And these are some of the ways that you can do it, right? So absolutely, it is a big opportunity for it. It's, it's the biggest opportunity with the, with the, with the new plans. And um, change advocacy, that's another topic you're passionate about. So a couple of things. Um, one of them is definitely change advocacy uh, from a nuclear perspective, right? And it is preaching nuclear to the public and preaching innovation to nuclear. Mm. And we have, I think that the culture in nuclear is still taking baby steps to go towards innovation. Mm. Uh, we're not ready yet as an industry to embrace all the innovation concepts. And I do understand that um, there is safety and safety is paramount and we all agree on that. But I do not see it as an either or. Mm. You can continue to be safe, you can continue to be compliant, but you can also innovate. And this is the idea, is that you look at these specific areas where you can innovate. And this is where you push and you push the envelope and you rethink, why do you do that? And that's why there is value in me coming from a totally different industry. I'm not a lifer in, in, in nuclear. And so a lot of times I look and I say, why do we do it this way, right? And in many times, it does make a lot of sense to me to do it this way. But in others, we just have to ask ourselves, does it really need to be done this way? Or can we do it in a simpler, faster, more productive way? So, okay, so now it's one thing for you to come in and ask the right questions, which right. is good. How then do you affect change? How do you get the culture itself to change? So even if you determine what is a good thing to change, right. they still have to go and change it. How do you get them to do it? It's, it's just having the conversations, right? Having the data to explain how, do, why would you do it this way? If you can do it this way and you can save X million of dollars per year, why wouldn't you do it a different way, right? So just having, just starting the conversations with everybody that you can talk to, whether it is, uh, executive at the utility or it's somebody in APRI or somebody, I mean, in, in those conferences that we go to, uh, starting the conversation just like we try to change, to change the conversation and have the narrative about nuclear itself and talking to the public and thinking about it a different way and not talk a lot about safety, but, you know, 
maybe thinking of you did a school and Thank how we you. can how yeah. we, how do we connect it with with renewables for example so that both of them are you know the CO so it's 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 just having those conversations starting those conversations so let's talk about that safety one for a second because this is something that I feel like I've got to drive home constantly with the nuclear industry too. Right. When you lead with, say, especially to someone outside the nuclear industry right. who isn't embedded in safety culture, when you lead with safety or even bring it up, it tends to scare people. It does. But to, how do we, I feel like the industry went through 20 years of training of safety culture to beat it into everyone's brain, hold the handrail everywhere you go, safety signs everywhere, right. safety, 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 safety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now what we're trying to do is we're trying to tell them uh, yeah, but only when you're with each other, and you can't you can't continue saying that when you're talking to customers, when you're talking to people in the community. It right. just scares them. So I feel like we almost um, pulled a fast one on them, and now we're expecting a big cultural shift even around the messaging around. That's safety. right. That's right. Have and you seen any resistance to to that? Or when you tell people, hey, don't lead with safety, lead with economics. Have you? Have you gotten pushback, and how do you deal with that? Yeah, it depends. It depends on the people. There are some people that very are very open to thinking differently, right? And you're going to have other people that have been in that industry for fifty years. This is what they know. This is this is how they think they should talk. And I don't think that you're going to be able to change their mind. Yeah. So it really depends. I think you have to start with people that could be, you know, evangelizing with you. So start with a small group of people that thinks like you that can go and preach the same uh, thing. And, and this is how you continue to go through the, through, through the community. And, and I mean, we're, we're never going to be able to change everybody's mind. That's but if we, start, if we start with a small group and then... And what about making um, nuclear cool? You mentioned that. I think that's so important. I think um, nuclear at the end of the day is a product. That's Many right. people don't think of it that way. They don't sell it that way, but it is. It is a product like anything else, and you have to sell a product. If you right. want to sell a product, you got to make people feel feel something. Yep. And making something cool is just another way of selling. It's a way right. of making someone feel a reaction when you put a product in front of them. And that reaction is, oh, I want that. It's That's shiny. Right. It's awesome. That's right. So what are some That's ideas right. on how to make nuclear cool? You know what? One of the things that actually is making it easier to make it cool is that all these companies that are starting to invest in the SMR, yeah. I mean, that, you know, there is no other industry that has as many companies yeah. that startups and everywhere like Bill Gates is investing in nuclear, right? Yeah. So just having that story is that, you know, that makes it cool, right? I think so. I think we got to find a way to then take that story to everybody because one of the things that's challenging in the way that media is delivered today is everything is so bucketed and segmented and you're just hearing things you already want to hear. It's actually really hard to break into someone else's bubble, but we have a really cool story to tell and we've got all of these startups and we've got, we've got stuff to change the messaging around nuclear with, but we still have to figure out how to get it in front of That's people. right. Like what is cooler? Like working on an app that just on your iPhone that does something silly or is it, cooler to work on software that runs the nuclear plants. <laughs> I know. I listen, I, I, so, <laughs> you know, I was out in Silicon Valley for the last uh, seven years, and I'm telling all my friends back there, hey, you know, you're a loser for just playing around with an app. That's right. Like, split the atom, why don't you? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that should be our message for being cool. <laughs> yeah. Great. So as we wrap up here, maybe you can just kind of share your perspective on you know, where this is all going and why this is important. Uh, you know what? I am very optimistic about the future. So I know that the picture could be grim by looking at all the plants that are closing, but I think that this is going to be a dip, and I'm hoping that at a certain point in time, we're going to get out of that. And getting out of that is going to be through the small modular reactors, the new reactors that we're going to go through. Uh, a lot of companies, a lot of utilities also are applying for licenses to renew. So that's that's good news. Um, I am hoping that software and data analytics, from my perspective, huge help for the industry. Uh, so I am really hoping that uh, we start leveraging the data that we have, doing the analytics, the predictive analytics that would help us get the insights and be much more efficient in running our plants. Once we get our costs down, it's game. Motivating. Thank you so much. Thank you.